as you know, our Fatima conference, we've given many, many lectures on the topics that we cover. And for some of you, it might be a little bit of a review. We always try to do something new and contemporary or something relevant to our times. But for some of you, maybe this might be your first conference, and so we'd like to review some of the material that we've covered in the past. I'd like to begin before the lecture to ask all of you to please pray for three different people. Uh, first is uh, Louis Ramirez. Louis Ramirez, he is in San Diego. He passed away this past week. Uh, Louis has had the Blessed Sacrament in the chapel in his home for 37 years. And Louis was a very, very wonderful, devout Catholic. Um, and I know that there were, in the beginning, they had the Blessed Sacrament. They had to have so many hours covered per week for holy hours, and I'm sure that there were many a week that the hours weren't going to be covered, so Louis, on his own, with his wife, uh, made up those holy hours. So Louis had the great privilege of living with our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament for 37 years. He was a very devout Catholic, and also he was a very down-to-earth person. Louis was Hispanic, and I, more, I heard more Mexican jokes from Louis than ever from anyone else. And he was really a nice, wonderful person. So uh, I believe his funeral is this coming week, and if you could please pray for the repose of his soul. We were mentioning in the, se- in the uh, sermon this morning that uh, I joined a seminary in 1974. When I joined, there were two other seminarians who joined with me, and one of them was a Brian Green. Uh, Brian Green is about my age. And uh, right now he is suffering from cancer. He probably has just a couple weeks to live. So if you could please pray for him. And he's battling cancer. He's very accepting of his illness and his death. Uh, he's been a good friend of Father Casmer and Father Gerard and I, and also the, uh, the Radecki twins, Father Francisco and Father Dominic. And, you know, when, we, when I look over the years, uh, I think of uh, those younger years. I came here when I was, I think, 13 or 14 Going to seminary when I was 15, I knew Father Casmer. I known Father Casmer at least for 43, 44 years. I known Father Gerard for about the same. So the priests go way back, and uh, it's uh, like I say, uh, a sad uh, occasion. This visit was going to probably be the last time I saw Brian. We w- visited him for about an hour, but if you could please pray for him, he only has a couple more weeks to live. He's not be able to eat or drink very well. And uh, you know he's been declining very rapidly. So if you could please pray for him. And lastly, I just wanted to ask for prayers for uh, Nicole Draymond. Uh, she has three uncles who are priests, Father Benedict, Father Brendan, and Father Gregory. She also has an aunt, Sister Emmanuel. And I believe it was three or four years ago, I think four, when she was in high school that she came down with Lyme's disease. And uh, ever since, she's been suffering very patiently, constant headaches, nonstop headaches, and she's always been an edification. Every time you visit her, uh, she's very meek and, and very peaceful and, and very resigned to her sufferings. And if it's God's will that she get better, uh, we pray for that. But I, I definitely think uh, in her case, she's a definitely a victim soul. You know, God sometimes blesses people in different ways. And there are certain souls that he knows are very generous in their love for God. And he visits them with a sickness or an illness. And many graces are drawn down by that. And I'd ask you to please pray for a Nicole Draymond. She's a great edification, very patient. And uh, whenever I think of crosses or difficulties or frustrations, I think of Nicole and thinking, I have it easy. I don't have it like she does. And, you know, all of us have our different crosses and trials. And sometimes when we have someone like Nicole patiently bearing this, her cross, uh, it helps us to pick up our cross and think we don't got it that bad. I was going to begin by saying I chose this topic. Father Benedict called me, oh, some months ago and asked, what is the topic? We've got to put a title to your talk. And I said, well, let me think about it. And one of the things I wanted this conference to be was something of an encouragement. That's why we chose the title, uh, In the End, Mary's Immaculate Heart Will Triumph, and also that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, the church. We live in very, very desperate times. There could be no question about that. 
and how important it is that we remind ourselves of Christ's promise. The gates of hell, Satan and his legions will not prevail. That being said, I'd have to just begin by saying Satan has done one hell of a job to try to destroy souls, to try to destroy the church. And when you really analyze things over the last 40 years, what he's done since Vatican II, incredible deception. The deception is so cleverly orchestrated, it is so incrementally inculcated, it was so subtly brought in that even the best of minds, the best of theologians, were deceived. And now we find ourselves 40 years later and we look at what's, what's the state of the church today. The church, the true church, has been reduced to a very small number of bishops, priests, religious, and laity. We look at our times. I don't want to you know, repeat. I don't know what Father, the other priests have said in their lectures, but clearly the devil has orchestrated a tremendous attack on the church. He's left no stone unturned to try to destroy the church. Today, we have a man who calls himself the Pope who is actively promoting homosexuality. That is utterly preposterous. I know many of you have heard this. Maybe some of you heard a little bit about it, maybe got a, a bits and pieces of it. But last October, they had the Synod on the Family the bishops and cardinals gathered for the synod. And amongst the topics, one of the topics were to the con- thinking, reconsidering, giving adulterers, those who are married, divorced, and remarried, thinking about a way to give them Holy Communion, to receive them back into the sacraments. Obviously, there's no talk of them separating or anything else like that, but giving adulterers the sacraments. The other very controversial thing was to try to propose at the Synod on the Family of All Things that somehow homosexual unions has some type of a positive element uh, to propose to the Christian community. So amazing is this that even secular people, secular media people picked up on this and said, is this the Catholic Church? Is the Pope Catholic? There was a prominent theologian. He, op- he gave an open address on the Internet to Francis I, and he said, You're, are you leading the, in the way to the apostasy? And the poor man, he doesn't realize the apostasies happened a long time ago. But the amazing thing is it's becoming so clear today these men, in the name of Catholicism, are destroying the church and still u- using that name of Catholicism. There was a Vatican II cardinal, Cardinal Burke. He's from St. Louis. He he had enough Catholic sense left in him to say, how could we even be discussing these things? He was very opposed to these issues, and shortly after that synod on the family, he was removed from his position and sent off to some very unimportant post, just some type of a title post just to get rid of him. It's amazing when we think of even men like Pat Buchanan. Uh, He's, you know, conservative, but he's Vatican II. But even he, in his article, had written this about the the synod on the family. Even Pat Buchanan said, if this continues, we might be talking about sedevicantism and that there's no pope. And for a man of that caliber to admit to that is very, very interesting. All of you know these things. You've heard of them before, etc. But I think it's important for us to realize that we are living in nothing less than the great apostasy, a worldwide falling away from the church. And when we think of, like, Francis I, I know you probably follow a little bit of his visit to the United States, where he said absolutely nothing of importance. There were, there were reporters saying, you know, isn't this man supposed to be teaching people how to go to heaven and about spiritual things? And he's so involved with Save the Planet and, and all these, what do you say, social issues. What about people going to hell? What about people trying to save their soul? What about mortal sin? 
Did he say anything about abortion, anything against abortion? No. It's just, like I say, incredible to contemplate the times in which we live. What I'd like to do is to review the basic theology about the papacy, because this whole quote, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, the church, we should understand it in the context in which our Lord had spoken these words. The words of our Lord really come from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 16, verse 18. This is important because in these times, the Protestants, the conservative Protestants, are pulling their hair out, saying, this man is the head of the Catholic Church, Francis, and he's saying stuff about homosexuality? This is preposterous. Protestants are recognizing that the way the Novus Ordo modern conciliar church is going, they're ushering in the Antichrist. It's very important for us to know our theology and the papacy to be able to defend it, because even though we live in the times of the apostasy, even though these Vatican II supposed popes are not popes at all, that doesn't diminish what Christ himself has established. Our Lord asked his apostles, whom do men say that I am? And some of the apostles said, John the Baptist, Elias, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now in response, our Lord said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this, reveal this to thee, but my Father in heaven. My grade school teacher, Sister Julianne, is probably turning over in her grave for my penmanship, and I'm writing fast here. <laughs> and I say to thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, we're going to put a couple dots here. And our Lord continues by saying, To thee... Do I give the keys of the kingdom of heaven? And I'm going to stop here because I'm running out of room anyway. And our Lord goes on to say, Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. It is important for us to know how to defend the papacy because this is a part of our Catholic faith. The important thing to remember is, is this. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verse 42, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon Bar-Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas which means rock. What do the Protestants say about this? The Protestants try to claim Jesus was not talking to Simon Barjona. He was not talking to Peter. He was talking about 
St. Peter's profession, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the rock they say that Christ built his church on. But that is preposterous because if we look at it, Jesus tells us who he's talking to. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. I say to thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. I remember one time I was driving out to Colorado, and I received a phone call from one of our parishioners somewhere in the United States. And he said, uh, Bishop, I'm having a little bit of trouble with this fellow I go to work with, and he's trying to say that this papacy is all an invention of the Catholic Church, that Jesus was not talking to Peter. He was talking about the profession that Peter made, and he talks about Petros and Petra and that there's different things. So I said, listen, uh, and he, the, the, the fellow was saying, this man at work is talking about the Greek this and the Greek that. I said, forget the Greek. You've got to go to the Hebrew, go to the Aramaic, which Jesus spoke. And the word that Jesus said was, thou art kephos, and upon this kephos I build my church. But I said, but further, if our Lord says, I give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. There could be no doubt that Christ was giving his very authority to St. Peter to bind and to loose. That's why his statue of St. Peter always has showing, holding the keys. But Christ established a papacy. And I also went on to say, we can argue John 1, 42, Matthew 16, 18. We can argue this back and forth, but I like to tell the Protestants, What's history? What's the reality? The history is that St. Peter, he went from Jerusalem to Antioch and finally to Rome. There he died June 29, 67 A.D. St. Peter was martyred, he was crucified upside down. That's a matter of history. But what happened after Peter? Was that the end? By no means not. It was after Peter that we see a succession of of, of popes. St. Linus, Anacletus, St. Clement. The interesting thing, St. Clement, he lived around 90 A.D. And there was a controversy amongst the Corinthians. The Corinthians could have had recourse to St. John the Apostle. He was closer. But no, they went further. They went to Pope St. Clement to settle the matter because... He was the head of the church. Hope you all can see there. I know there's a lock on these on these things here. That'll help. So the Corinthians were put in their place by Pope St. Clement, showing that he had authority. And he exercised that authority uh, in a very important matter, demanding that they submit to what he had to say. Another issue is that of the Easter celebration. I wanted to bring to your attention that in the early church, there was a controversy about the celebration of Easter. Now in Rome, Easter was celebrated. It was the Sunday which follows the first full moon of the vernal equinox. This is the time of the Passover, but it was always on Sunday. Now, there were some of the apostles, especially St. John. St. John, for the sake of the, the Jews, 
he allowed them to celebrate Easter at the time of the Passover, but whenever it landed, it was not necessarily Sunday. Now, St. John did this for the converted Jews to facilitate their conversion and not to make anything more difficult for them. So they celebrated Easter at the time of the Passover, but not on Sunday. It was just a day that it happened to be after the full moon and the equinox, etc. So there was this, this difference, and it was in the time of Pope St. Victor, and also Pope St. Anacletus. This difference was brought to the attention of the Pope, first by St. Polycarp and then by St. Irenaeus. Now, why St. Polycarp, why St. Irenaeus? Because St. Polycarp, he was the disciple of St. John, so he was trying to defend this practice. St. Polycarp's disciple was St. Irenaeus. So why did he was bring it once again to the Pope? Because of the issue was they were trying to be following what, the, what they had received from St. John. But the, the Pope in Rome said, no, this is the way it's going to be from here on out. And, and also this topic had come up in the year 325 to settle the matter once and forever at the Council of Nicaea. Nicaea was to condemn Arius, define very clearly what the church had always held, the divinity of Jesus Christ. He was true God and true man, one person with two natures, but also to settle this issue of the celebration of Easter. You know, a lot of Protestants today, it's amazing, but they celebrate Easter and they follow what has been determined by the Catholic Church. That's, that's an amazing thing. And not only that, but when they talk about the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, uh, we're only Bible Christians, we don't only believe anything that's in the Bible. Sunday goes back to the time of the Apostles. And it's the Lord's Day because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. Interestingly, the Seventh-day Adventists who worship on Saturday, they say to the other Protestants, you people are following what the Catholic Church has established. But when we think of what Christ has established, obviously our Lord founded this church on Peter, the rock. He gathered together his apostles. He told them, go teach all nations, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, whatever he said, as what's, all things whatsoever I've commanded you, you teach them. And Christ promised I will be with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. So in these times, which are very, very difficult, why? Because we have these men claiming to be Pope and radically contradicting what's in Scripture, radically contradicting what was taught in the past, uh, and they're doing it in the name of Catholicism. And in past times, before Vatican II, Heretics would leave the church. Look at Luther. Luther broke with the Catholic Church. He started the Lutherans. Henry VIII broke with the church, declared himself the head of the Anglican Church, and started a new church. And so did all the other heretics. But today, these men are still within the external structure, claiming to be the hierarchy, claiming to be pope, bishops, cardinals, etc. In the name of Catholicism, they're destroying the faith of the people. I uh, wanted to share with you another thing, and that is when we teach in a seminary, we not only study, obviously, sacred scripture, but what is very important is also history, ecclesiastical history, and look at the history of the church, because that's the reality. I remember talking to one Protestant fella, and he was trying to, we went round and round on different parts of scripture, and this verse, that chapter, all that. I said, you know, we can keep arguing about this, and I'm fine with that. But I said, let's go back to the time of the apostles. When the apostles were told by Jesus, go teach all nations, they went on taught, and they spread the church. What church was that? Was that a Protestant church, or was that a Catholic church? Let's look at that early church, look at, look at it very clearly, and see what kind of a church was it. Was it your church, or was it my church? Well, first of all, we have St. Ignatius of Antioch. 
St. Ignatius of Antioch, <clears throat> he was the first one, and he lived around 107 A.D., he was the first one to use the word Catholic, universal church, identifying Christ church as the Catholic church. But we can also look at the early councils of the church. We talked about the Council of Nicaea, 325. Who was the pope that presided over that council? It was Pope St. Sylvester. And it's interesting, when the Protestants try to talk about the Council of Nicaea, they don't say the bishops gathered with the legates of Pope St. Sylvester. They talk about delegates. They try to water it down. But the reality is, the history is, that the Council of Nicaea, it was the Catholic bishops with the delegates of Pope St. Sylvester. He was very elderly, and he confirmed the dogmatic teachings of the Council of Nicaea. We also take, for example, the Council of Ephesus. Father Bernard Utley mentioned about Ephesus, about the condemnation of Nestorius in three or 431 A.D. This was under Pope St. Celestine. <clears throat> it's a matter of history. <clears throat> the same pope that, Saint, that sent St. Patrick to Ireland presided over this council and confirmed the dogmatic teachings at the Council of Ephesus. Protestants have no clue. They can't even go to the early church. All that they can try to jump is to the Bible. But their idea of, of Catholicism, or I should say Christianity, is completely erroneous. Because even if you look at <clears throat> excuse me, the, <clears throat> the history of the Bible, number one, it was the Pope, Pope St. Damasus, he codified the book saying these are the authentic books. And that was at the Synod of Rome in 382 A.D. So the canon of sacred scripture was authoritatively set by the Pope at that time. You might not understand <clears throat> what that meant, but in those times they were what was called apocryphal books. These were phony books floating around about the life of Christ and very spurious and had very sensational things. But how did Pope St. Damasus know what were the authentic books of the Bible? How did he know those from the apocryphal ones? This is, we're talking about 382. Well, very simply, the early church, the fathers of the church, these are men who wrote on the Catholic faith, and they quoted from sacred scripture. If you take all the fathers of the East and the West and put all their quotes together, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of references to sacred scripture, and you know what books that the fathers of the church considered to be authentic. It was very easy to know what they recognized as authentic and what they rejected as being spurious. But even after... Pope St. Damasus in 382, we all know there was not the invention of the printing press until the 1400s. Most people didn't even have a Bible. How did they learn the faith? It was because Christ founded a teaching church. And our Lord did that because for the first 1400 years, there would be, most people wouldn't have a Bible. So the idea of this idea of uh, pass out the Bible, everybody figure it out themselves, is a complete fabrication. It's not the church Christ founded. It has nothing to do with the one true church. When we look at the, the different quotes from our Lord, we have Matthew twenty eight nineteen. This was given to all the apostles. He commanded, go teach all nations baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all I have commanded. Now here's a very important quote our Lord said, and I am with you all days. 
even to the consummation of the world. If we examine this quote from our Lord, we understand exactly. When our Lord said, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, whenever you look through the history of the councils, the teachings of the popes, you'll find that the popes and the councils down through the history of the church, they're taking from sacred scripture and from tradition, and they're drawing from these two sources and infallibly teaching. This is what we call divine revelation. This is what God has revealed to mankind. Christ commanded his apostles to go teach. They taught. We get some of the teachings from Scripture and from tradition, the two together. And that's the reason why, if you read anything the Pope teaches, anything the councils have taught authoritatively, they're always drawing from Scripture and tradition, Scripture and tradition. Why is this so important today? Well, because of the fact that if you look at what the popes have taught up to Vatican Council II, we have what we have is continuity. They're constantly teaching the same thing. It's a wonderful thing when you look at the popes and councils of the church. If you didn't know the name or didn't know the date, it looked like the same person was writing all of these things because it's very clear, very precise, and extremely uh, based on scripture and tradition. And we have what we call this, this, this continuity of doctrine. At Vatican II, we see this, this radical break. And what is that radical break but against the first commandment? I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. It's a sin against faith to worship with other religions. This is something that was very clear in the Pope's teachings prior to Vatican II. We're going to do this very, very succinctly because I know this is a review for many of you. Some of you may be first time. But we have <clears throat> Pope Pius IX in a syllabus of error. He condemned condemned religious indifferentism, that one religion is as good as another. We have also Pope Pius XI explicitly condemning the ecumenical movement in Mortalium Animos. In this encyclical, he said, if you promote ecumenism, it's equivalent to apostasy, abandoning the religion revealed by God. We also have the Code of Canon Law. This is Canon 1258. Forbid Catholics to take active worship with the non-Catholics and non-Catholic services. This has become so common today. Uh, Benedict XVI, John Paul I, Francis I, they all worship with other religions. And as I was going to dwell on that just very briefly because we're on the topic. But John Paul II, who was now supposedly St. John Paul the Great, uh, he would go to Assisi and call for these meetings with all the religions of the world, asking them to pray for world peace. And all that he was doing was fulfilling what was said at Vatican Council II that we should practice ecumenism. The needed grace recommends it. They, in Vatican II, at a Tata Nostra de decree on the, or the declaration on the relationship of the church with non Christian religions, we need to acknowledge, preserve, and promote the good that's in these other religions. Hindus, loving, trusting flight to God. Buddhists, contain a supreme enlightenment. Muslims, we look with esteem on them. John Paul II went so far as to say, that the Holy Spirit is present and active in all the religions of the world. He actually said that the Holy Spirit has in, in, inspired these men of these, that have founded these other religions. He's inspired them, and through this inspiration, they've written it down and developed these religions. If that be so, 
then we don't need his first commandment because there's no more false, false gods. You see how utterly preposterous this is? And now recently, as things have gone from bad to worse, now they're debating the sixth and the ninth commandment. These commandments are not debatable. It's God's law. I don't want to get off into a tangent, but I do want to talk about the sixth and ninth commandment, and especially with this issue of homosexuality, because many of you are going to be confronted with, well, what's the matter with it? They were born that way. They can't help it. They love each other. What do you got something against that? And you got Francis I saying, who am I to judge? And then there's a woman who supposedly has some type of a, a transgender operation, comes with her partner, both these women, go and have a private audience with Francis I. Francis I wrote a letter to this woman. She's the producer of these books for children promoting homosexuality. He said, go ahead. Good luck to you. Keep going on it. This was publicly uh, uh, written in the uh, Italian newspapers, and the Vatican was saying, well, he really didn't mean what, what you're trying to say he meant, etc." There's a notoriously active homosexual priest. John Paul, or I say Francis I went to see him. They were holding hands in hands and walking into the church. So he's giving the nod. He's given the wink of the eye. Go ahead. Go ahead. There were bishops in Germany who were astounded that some of the bishops in Germany wanted to give communion to adulterers, those who are married, divorced, remarried, give them communion. And when these bishops tried to say, hey, you can't do that, these other bishops said, Francis is already allowing this in Argentina. Interestingly, at the Synod on the Family last year, we talked about those two topics, giving communion to adulterers and also you know, trying to say homosexuality is some type of positive element for the Christian community. Those two items did not have the two-thirds majority that they needed, but they still had a majority. The Most of the bishops voted in favor of those two topics. And in the final draft, Francis I said, go ahead and put those back into the draft. Go ahead and put those back in. So what we need to know is this. This is not representing the Catholic Church, the Catholic faith. And I want to get into this issue of the papacy very, very quickly because we talked about, you know, thou art Peter and upon this rock will build my church and Simon Barjona, thou shalt build called Kephas. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth is heaven. We looked through a little bit of the history. We can go through the councils of the church. The popes were there to confirm those councils. Throughout the history of the church, the popes are there making decisions. But we need to make the proper distinctions and that is very, very important because there are traditional Catholics today who are sadly and very uh, seriously mistaken on the papacy. What are those distinctions? The distinction is, when we think of the Pope... We can look at him in two aspects. As the supreme head of the church and also as an individual. As an individual, the pope is not impeccable. Okay, he can commit sin. But as the supreme head of the church, he's infallible. Herein lies a big problem because we can show you different theologians who say if the Pope tells you to commit sin, you have to disobey. You can't, you have to obey God and not man. And that's true. If the Pope, as an individual, he's a human being, he can commit sin, he can tell others to commit sin. And when he does that, you don't obey. But when it comes to the Pope as the supreme head of the church making laws for the universal church, the words of Christ, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. 
Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And it's the teaching of Catholic theology that when the Pope makes a universal law binding the faithful throughout the world, he is infallible. In this sense, he can never legislate something that would be contrary to faith and morals. He can never bind us, officially bind us as a supreme head to something that would be detrimental to our salvation, to our faith. Can't do that. But you see, there are some traditional Catholics who say, well, he's the Pope, but we have to disobey. And they'll quote, you know, these different theologians, Suarez and Bellarmine or whatever, saying this and that, whatever else. But that's not what we're talking about today. To be very specific, in 1983, John Paul II, JP II, came out with a new code of canon law. In canon 843, it is legislated that Protestants can go to Holy Communion. That's sacrilegious. Sacrilegious. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Later on, and I think it was 1992, he gave an address on ecumenism, and he says, when there's a mixed marriage between a Catholic and a Protestant, a Eucharistic sharing is possible. You can go ahead and give them Holy Communion. The previous laws of the church, this was the 1917 code, so the canon 731 said it's forbidden to give the sacraments to heretics and schismatics unless they are reconciled to the church. But this is something blatantly sacrilegious. Now I'll give you another example, and this was interesting. This was the issue of the Assyrian church of the East. These are schismatics. And John Paul II, with Benedict, I, uh, Benedict XVI, when he was Cardinal Rattinger, supposedly Cardinal Rattinger, they determined that Catholics could go to this Mass, this schismatic Mass. They said, this Mass is valid. The problem is, these schismatics, their Mass does have, does, it's without a consecration. There's no consecration at this Mass. You can look this up on the Vatican website. The actual public statement of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith under Rattinger, approved by JP2, the Assyrian Church of the East, their Mass is valid, and Catholics may utilize that Mass. How can you have a Mass without a consecration? You can't. The words of consecration brings about transubstantiation. This isn't even close. I mean, anybody with a little ounce of theology can tell you no mass at all. So, interestingly, Cardinal Rattinger, amongst his ramblings and the books that he's written, he wrote something about this. He said, today there are some, probably meaning traditional Catholics, who make a big deal about words. And they're all hung up on words. They've got to remember the validity of the sacraments. It's not about words. It's about the Christian community. That is so utterly preposterous. Christ established the seven sacraments. He gave to those sacraments an outward sign, a matter and a form. It is primarily the form that determines the matter, and the form very clearly expresses the graces and the, what's given in the sacrament. For them to say their Mass is valid without a consecration is just utterly ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous preposterous. But these are very clear-cut examples of definitely, without any example or without any question, crossing the line. But we'd also look at this too. There are some who are saying, well, he hasn't spoken ex cathedra yet, so unless he teaches heresy in some ex cathedra statement, then he's still the Pope. That's not true. As an individual... As an individual, he's capable of sin. And as an individual, he's capable of sin against faith. Now, this is just a really quick review. What is the worst sin, actually the most offensive sin against God? The most offensive sin against God is hatred of God. That's the worst sin. 
Hatred of God is the worst because God is the object of the first three commandments. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Keep holy, the, uh, you know, uh, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Keep holy the Lord's day. Those three commandments pertain to God. Not that you won't go to hell for murdering somebody or adultery or stealing a whole lot. You go to hell for that. But the first three commandments, God is the, 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 the object of those commandments, and they're more offensive to sin against those first three commandments. This is the worst sin, hatred of God. But hatred of God does not equal becoming outside the church. You might think, what? A Catholic who hates God is still a Catholic. Immortal sin, but he's still in the church. Why? Because the church, as Christ founded, is a visible society. You've got to know who's a member who's not. St. Robert Bellarmine goes into great detail about this. As a visible society, there are two ways you know some as a member. First of all, they have to be baptized. And secondly, they have to profess profession of the faith. That's the reason why if someone publicly does not profess the faith, if someone publicly, pertinaciously, knowingly, and, 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 and obstinately denies things that are divine and Catholic faith, they're outside the Catholic Church. When we have John Paul II saying the Holy Spirit is present and active in all the religions of the world, when John Paul II says that the Holy Spirit has inspired these men of other religions, when John Paul II worships with these other religions, his act of worship with these other religions are acts of apostasy. As an individual, he would definitely fall into this category of being a public heretic. Francis I, same thing. Benedict XVI, same thing. We have very clearly so many issues that we can show and point to and say these are acts of apostasy. Not only that, but in these areas where they should have been infallible, they are not. You see, in, in the infallibility of the church... We could talk about the object of infallibility and also the possessors of infallibility. For the object, there's two objects of the church's infallibility. The primary object is sacred scripture and tradition. That's the primary object of the church's infallibility. The secondary object of infallibility is or are those things that are closely related to, to sacred scripture and tradition. One of them is universal laws. Another is that of the sacred liturgy. As you pray, so you believe. Another is the canonization of saints. possesses of infallibility. The Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra. Now I want to describe a little bit about this term and also the totality of bishops. The bishops in union with the Pope are infallible in a council and also in their ordinary universal teachings. What they teach day to day in union with the Pope on matters of faith and morals and are binding the faithful, that is also infallible. So in an ecumenical council, and also their universal, ordinary teachings. This whole issue about ex cathedra, I like to dwell on that very, very briefly. Vatican Council I, 1870. What was the issue about papal infallibility at that time? There was this error called Gallicanism. Gallicanism comes from 
the word Gaul, which is France. There was an erroneous belief that the Pope was only infallible when he taught together with all the bishops of the world the totality of bishops. He can't speak infallibly by himself. In Pope Pius IX, what he did with the totality of bishops to end this Gallicanism said, we, with all the bishops, you know, at this council, teach that when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, as supreme head of the church, and he's defining something on matters of faith and morals, that it's infallible of itself and not because of the agreement of the bishops. It would have done no good to end uh, Gallicanism if the Pope Pius IX said, I declare that when I speak by myself, I am infallible. That would have not ended it. So he said, I, with the totality of bishops, teach that the Pope, supreme head of the church, when he speaks ex cathedra as the supreme head of the church. During this time of Vatican I, there were objections being raised. There were three groups of bishops and clergy there. There were those who were in favor of papal infallibility. There were some in favor, but not now. And that's because there was a lot of pressure from the secular realm not to define papal infallibility. And then there were a few opposed. Now, the few that are opposed after the definition of papal infallibility, that was the beginning of what they called the old Catholic movement. How many ever heard of the old Catholics? Schismatics, okay? That's where they came from. But as we know, this was all resolved. Pope Pius IX, he had very clearly the support of the bishops and went ahead and covered these matters about papal infallibility, ex cathedra, etc. But the whole issue was the Pope can speak infallibly. He doesn't need the other bishops with him. During this time, when they were trying to talk about in the past history, there were two popes that had come up, Pope Honorius and Pope Liberius. Should have written them the other way around. Pope Liberius was first, and he was exiled, and he was in captivity. And it was said that he signed a document agreeing to Arianism. Well, first of all, as a, a matter of historical fact, you can't prove for certain that he signed it. And even if he did sign it, the formula that was presented, even, by, even according to the opinion of St. Athanasius, was not heretical. But as soon as he was out of his captivity, he very, very relentlessly went after Arianism, condemned it very, very clearly. So as Cardinal Manning, Henry Manning at Vatican I said, Pope Liberius is not an issue. Pope Honorius, another case. He was a negligent pope. There was a Sergius who was promoting this monothelite heresy, and Sergius very smoothly talked to Honorius, like, you know, you don't really need to deal with this right now. Why don't you just let it go? And that's all Sergius needed to spread heresy. After the death of Honorius, it was the next pope and council that condemned Sergius, condemned that heresy, and it was also added in the condemnation Pope Honorius, but not for heresy, but because of the fact he was negligent in using his authority as the pope to squelch this heresy. So he wasn't condemned as a heretic. But one thing is for sure. When it comes to heresy, if someone's a public heretic, he's not a member of the church because those are the two ways you know someone's, the two, one of the two ways you know someone's a Catholic, baptism, profession of the Catholic faith. And theologians say, St. Alphonsus Liguri, St. Antoninus, St. Jobber Bellerman, and others besides say very clearly, heretical popes are no popes. They depose themselves. They lose 
their authority within the church. Very interestingly, and I know canon law does not pertain directly to this papal issue, but there's a canon, and it's canon 188, number 4. It talks about loss of office within the church. How does someone lose the office or position of the church? And this is, is that it's called tacit resignation. You do this, you, re- not, you resign your position without declaration. You don't need a declaration. It automatically happens. And what is that? Public defection from the faith. And not only that, but what do they give as a, in the footnotes, where do they come up with this law? It comes from Pope Paul IV, 1559, cum ex apostolatus. If you would give me one second here, we can move this thing. I'll show you the cum ex apostolatus because this is very important and authoritative. Could you just wheel this out of the way here? I hope that you can see this. Maybe. I'm not sure if this even has a focus light on it. Would it help if we turn the lights off or no? Okay. Further, if ever it should appear that any bishop, even one acting as an archbishop, patriarch, or primate, or a cardinal of the Roman church or legate, as mentioned above, or even the Roman pontiff, whether prior to his promotion to cardinal or prior to his election as Roman pontiff, has beforehand deviated from the Catholic faith or fallen into any heresy, we enact, decree, determine, and define such promotion or election in and of itself, even with the agreement and unanimous consent of all the cardinals, shall be made null, legally invalid, and void. It should not be possible for such a promotion or election to be deemed valid or to be to be valid neither through reception of office, consecration, subsequent administration, possession, nor even the punitive, the outward enthronement of the Roman pontiff himself, together with the veneration and obedience accorded to him by all. Such promotion and election shall not, through a lapse of time in a foregoing situation, be considered even partially legitimate in any way. Each and all the words as acts, laws, appointments of, so, of those so promoted and elected, indeed, whatever flows therefrom, shall be lacking in force and shall grant no stability or legal power to anyone whatsoever. Those promoted or elected by that fact and without the need to make any further declaration shall be deprived of any dignity, position, honor, title, authority, office, and power. Paul IV in 1559 made it very, very clear with regard to heretics by divine law are barred from election to the papacy. What's interesting, and we want to show you something as you've seen in the past. What we're dealing with today is not something that is novel. We've shown you this in the past, but for those who are newcomers, first time here, this is the prayer you can see right here Leo the 13th, Moto Proprio, September 25th, 1888. Now, I'd like to bring you to your attention this before I get into that. There was a priest, a Monsignor George Dillon, I believe he's from England, and he exposed the Masons' view to, or their plans to destroy the church. So he wrote this book, The Grand Orient Freemasonry Unmasked. He had this book, the main excerpts, translated into Italian. And when Pope Leo XIII read this, he said, I want this completely translated in Italian, and I'm paying for it out of my own pocket. And in the, the plot of the Masons, the Alta Vendita, they said, we are going to go and take over the papacy. It's not for us to destroy it. It's for us to usurp it, to take it over and use the papacy as a means of promoting Masonry and destroying the church from within. So mind you, Pope Leo XIII, mindful of the instructions of the Alta Vendita to destroy the church and take over the papacy, 
he wrote this, Prayer to St. Michael. This is an exact photocopy right out of the Recolta. And if we look here, right on this line, these most crafty enemies have filled an inebriate with gall and bitterness the church, the spouse of the Immaculate Lamb. They have laid impious hands on their most sacred possessions. In the holy place itself, where has been set up the, the sea of the most blessed Peter and the chair of truth for the light of the world, they have raised the throne of their abominable in piety with the iniquitous design that when the pastor has been struck, the sheep may be scattered. That is exactly what the Masons were planning on doing, striking the shepherd and scattering the sheep. I know that many of you have seen these things before, but there's also the book by Sylvester, Father Sylvester Berry. He quotes and he talks about the apocalypse. He gives a commentary on the apocalypse. We have them here, but we're going to be running out of time, so we have to do this very quickly. What does Pope or Father Sylvester talk about the papacy? Chapter 12 of the Apocalypse. He talks about how Satan will try to destroy the papacy because he knows when there's a long time when there's no pope and interregnum, he can wreak havoc within the church. The most disastrous times in the history of the church when there was no pope, when the chair of Peter was vacant. Now it's interesting when we read the sacred scripture on this matter, This is from St. Paul's letter to the second, uh, second Thessalonians. The day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and is exalted above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits in the temple of God and gives himself as if he were God. We go down to this next point here. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work, provided only that he who at present restraining it does still restrain till he has gotten out of the way. Father Sylvester Berry says, who is that one who restrains the mystery of iniquity? It has been restraining the mystery of iniquity until he's gotten out of the way. Then the wicked one will be revealed. Father Sylvester says, that's the Pope. The devil knows the disastrous consequences when there is no Pope. Our, the enemies of the church have said, the Masons, the Communists, we're going to infiltrate within the Catholic Church. We're going to destroy it from within. I know many of you are familiar with Bella Dodd, but Bella Dodd, hopefully it's a little bit thicker and easy to read. Bella Dodd, also a prominent member of the Communist Party, was converted to Catholicism in 1952 and began to reveal the tactics of the party. In the 1930s, we put 1,100 men into the priesthood to destroy the church from within. Right now, they are in the highest places of the church. She said that in the future, you will not recognize the Catholic Church. That was the 1930s. We also have prominent French Freemason, Yves Masoudan, a cumanim as that seen by a traditional Freemason, wrote in 1908, the goal is no longer the destruction of the church, but rather to make use of it by infiltrating it. And... We also have Manning Johnson, a former official of the Communist Party in America, gave in the, fo the following in 1953 to the House Committee on Un-American Activities. The communist leadership in the United States realized that the infiltration tactic in this country would have to adapt itself to American conditions. In the earliest stages, it was determined that with only a small forces available to them, it would be necessary to concentrate communist agents in the seminaries. The practical... Conclusion drawn by the Red Leaders was that these institutions would make it possible for a small communist minority to influence the ideology of the future clergymen in past conducive to communist purposes. This policy of infiltrating seminaries was successful beyond even our communist expectations. It is no secret that the church has been infiltrated. And this is, I can give you my own couple personal things, uh, my father, I'm very grateful that he was very 
well educated by the Christian brothers uh, in the 19, say, early 1940s. He was very in tune to what was going on during the changes. He knew that they weren't right. He couldn't necessarily put his finger on it. But he used to teach CCD uh, uh, in our parish, uh, south side of Chicago. And they used to have these different classes and seminars. And everything was very traditional in the beginning, early 60s. But mid-60s, late 60s, things started to radically change. Now, he had a very good friend. They used to think the like, very similar ideas as far as you know, traditional Catholicism, etc. This friend told my father, he said, I went to a seminar and this nun was teaching us about the new catechisms that were going to be coming out. My father had since gotten out of the teaching of CCD. And he said that uh, the sister was just coming up with things that were blatantly incorrect about the Catholic faith, uh, things that would be, he said, I, I consider as erroneous teachings. And he kept raising his hand and contradicting sister and and at the end of it, he wanted to talk to sister. Now, my father said that his really good friend of him said, he talked to sister afterwards. Sister looked around and said, Mr., listen. When we take over, people like you are not going to be tolerated. We're going to be putting people like you away. And the man was like, wow. He could never prove what that sister said, but the preposterous thing is what she was teaching. Uh, there was an r- article written um, in a national newspaper. It was called The Wanderer. How many have ever heard of The Wanderer? Many, most of you, yeah. There was lay people writing into, into The Wanderer saying, what is going on with the news catechisms? They're trying to say in some of the catechisms, how is it that the Old Testament prophets were like Karl Marx or such like bizarre things? I remember when I was in school, it was good catechism until Vatican II. After Vatican II, I remember they put a big mountain on the board and said, this is heaven. We're going up the Catholic road. But if you don't want to go up the Catholic road, you can go any road you want. All religions are all roads to heaven. Doesn't matter which road you go up to, all of them go to heaven. Many of you, I'm sure you older folks, uh, you experienced those things. You saw that you had to go through the fight and the to what is going on in the church. Very, very confusing times. But I wanted to, in the first part of this talk, just lay down the foundation for the papacy. Christ indeed established the papacy, the rock upon which he will build his church. And the wonderful thing is this. We have the consistent continuity of all these teachings of the popes and councils of the church for the last 2,000 years that give us the very solid foundation that what's happening at Vatican II is totally, and since Vatican II, is totally uh, erroneous and a part of the apostasy. The point is this. The Pope can't invent anything new. Councils of the Church can't invent anything new. They can only take what Christ has taught and expound upon that. What happened after Vatican II has no bearing in Scripture or tradition. To worship with other religions, to recognize other gods, is clearly against the first commandment clearly a sin against the first commandment. It's been condemned by many a church teaching. What I'd like to do in the second part of the uh, lecture here, talk, is to get into some very specifics. Uh, what is the situation of the church today? There are many, many different opinions there. If you got on the internet, you're going to be, you can be easily confused. There are those who say, these men, these Vatican II men are the popes, we just disobey them. There are some who say that with regard to jurisdiction, there's no jurisdiction, stay home, don't go anywhere. There are some who say old, old priest or no priest. You can only go to the old priest. All these others who were ordained since Vatican II, even though they're ordained validly and traditionally, you can't go to them because there's no jurisdiction. There are some who uh, are very big about that bishops consecrated without a papal mandate are not to be considered as Catholic bishops. You've been excommunicated. So I'd like to cover these things because you probably read them or come across them at one time or another. And I'd like to give you some a little bit of ammunition of where to find the answers and what the answers are. And we do that very, very briefly. We are limited. We only have uh, 30 minutes left, 35 minutes left. So if we could take a five-minute break, I'll get a glass of water, and then we'll finish this up by covering the practical contemporary things. Thank you. Go ahead.